stuff back from us and um, it is arriving even as we speak more will come tomorrow so we're we're hard after it there's uh, 24 of them and uh, um, Mark is doing his job and I fell a little bit behind but so tomorrow uh, we're hoping they're all, they'll all be out to you tomorrow uh, any other announcements Michelle no we're cool on your um, <clears throat> Your first submission for your team project, Jim and Mark will send out the grades on that individually to your teams. Um, that will come back on your feedback. But the grades that you get will not be posted to WebCT until next week. That's it. Okay. Um, what a pleasure for me to introduce my friend Chris Clover. Chris and I go way back. Uh, I'll read the official stuff here, but uh, he's one of you guys, an ISU grad, and uh, I can tell you uh, this vignette that uh, if he's not able to see ISU football games in person, he, he tapes them because he can't stand it if they lose, and then he'll watch the tape if they win and throw it away if they lose. So this is what, this is what we call a basic, uh, a basic fan. Uh, Chris worked in the uh, – you guys are all familiar with the, the big upside-down funnel out here, which is the C6. Um, in Chris's day, that wasn't here, um, and uh, we had a cave over in, uh, in Black, and uh, he did his, uh, uh, his work in robotics stuff, which was, which was really, really cool. You could, uh, you could take a, a robot holding a, um, a something or other, like a Black, and you put in the inertias and all. Sorry for those of you who aren't engineers. I won't go way on, but some of the people here are like this. Think the robot's holding something, and it's programmed like it was in space. So when you push it, it'll it'll feel like. I mean, the robot will make it move in such a way that. So you, the idea was, in due time, you could practice repairs and stuff on something that moved like it was in a no gravity environment. Really, really cool stuff. Um, that was uh, a few years ago. When was that? We, didn't, we don't even remember anymore. It was, it was a while ago. So let me, uh, let me go through some official stuff here that will fill in the blanks. Um, Dr. Clover served as president and CEO of Mechdyne Corporation since, its founding, since founding the company in 1996. He earned a PhD in mechanical engineering and an MBA with a strategic planning emphasis from Iowa State University. In 2001, he was awarded the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for the Technology Division Midwest in recognition of Mechdyne's achievements. I should tell you, if you don't know, many of you here know, but Mechdyne is in Marshalltown, and it's a big company with uh, 100, 110. 110. 110 employees. So starting with a uh, uh, classic entrepreneur start, starting with uh, two guys in a pole barn and. Uh, Bare light bulb. Now there's 110 employees, and uh, they did the C6. So they're the biggest VR solutions outfit uh, in the United States for sure. He's a recipient recipient of the Honeywell Foundation Engineering and Business Fellowship Award and the Iowa State University Research Excellence Award in recognition of outstanding research accomplishments in the engineering program. His private prior work includes positions with engineering animation. NASA, Fisher Controls International, and Linux Industries. He's widely published in the areas of robotics, haptic feedback, control system design, vehicle simulation, vehicle handling, and maneuvering, rollover, and tire mechanics. Please welcome Chris Clover. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. Uh, it's funny how you're your steps are a little lighter when you're living in a cyclone state, so um, um, it's been a, a good couple of weeks. Our, um, <clears throat> we, the, the HR staff in our company um, doesn't filter on uh, Hawkeye Cyclone affiliation, unfortunately, and so Friday before the game, everybody wore beat state shirts that were Hawkeye fans, and it was a lot of fun to wear didn't beat state shirts uh, the following week, so that was fun. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I know a lot of the speakers here um, uh, this uh, for the class this semester are um, way above my pay grade in terms of what they know about globalization and what they do. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that um, uh, I can talk a little bit about, you know, they're probably talking a lot at the 50,000 foot level. I'm going to talk about the five foot level. So 
Uh, what that means is, is uh, uh, if you're thinking about starting a company, or you have a company, or you work for a small company, um, you know, uh, anymore you still have to think about think globally and think about what it means to do business in parts of the world. And there's a lot of uh, nuts and bolts sorts of things that I certainly never thought about uh, until we actually uh, got into doing that. So uh, talk a little bit about tonight about um, competition and culture and currency. I apologize for the format. It looked great uh, when I emailed it last night. So I'm not sure what happened there with the format. But uh, I'll see if I can make this thing work. So a little bit first about Mechdyne. Uh, as Jim said, we build uh, turnkey uh, solutions and, and uh, visualization solutions like the C6, if you're familiar with that. Um, our roots go back to uh, 1988, although uh, uh, I actually founded the company in 1996, uh, but through some mergers and acquisitions, various things, we've, we've got roots go back a little further. Um, we do have a worldwide presence. We do uh, uh, systems uh, all over the world. Uh, and we've got an install base of, of, of over 700 projects now. Uh, for any of you that are familiar with um, uh, Jim Collins, Built to Last, or Good to Great, um, uh, you know, you ha it's, it's always good to have a purpose for your company beyond just making money. Um, so what keeps us uh, driving every day is, is um, uh, to enable discovery. So what that means is, is we help our customers uh, discover what it is that, that they need to discover. And we do that through uh, visualization technology. So um, just, again, a quick timeline. Um, um, we are, uh, have actually done some acquisitions, actually done an international acquisition when we acquired Fakespace, system, Fakespace Systems in, in 2003. Um, Fakespace is actually a Canadian company, um, and believe it or not, Canada is not the 51st state, and it was uh, actually uh, fairly uh, complicated, more, much more complicated than, than I would have imagined. So um, we, we do business with, with um, a lot of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, large uh, government uh, uh, agencies and institutions, a lot of higher education institutions like the fine one that we're uh, uh, standing in this evening. Uh, so we're pretty proud of, of uh, where we've come from and, and kind of the customer base we've been able to um, develop. And one of the interesting things about our customer base is, is uh, they're the ones that actually take us all over the world. So some of the projects we've done have actually been for U.S.-based companies, but they've uh, you know, planted these projects in, in some pretty interesting places. Um, so quickly, uh, what we do is, uh, again, you, applying visualization technology to, to solve problems and help our customers uh, uh, discover. And um, one good example is oil and gas exploration, where uh, you take 3D seismic data and try to figure out where to drill for oil, or um, sometimes where not to drill for oil. And one of the things you find is that mistakes get real expensive in, in the oil industry. So if you're trying to, to build an oil rig uh, in the Gulf of Mexico or off the China Sea or uh, the North Sea, uh, if you put a $100 million or $200 million oil rig uh, in the wrong spot, uh, that's not a good thing. So these guys like to uh, use this technology to, to figure out where, where to uh, drill. Um, do a lot in the government space. Uh, we do a lot of business with Los Alamos National Labs and Sandia National Labs. Uh, we do a lot with the uh, Department of Defense uh, and any number of interesting applications, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, the automotive uh, aerospace manufacturing space. Uh, um, you know, car companies will use virtual reality to do virtual prototyping. So for example, uh, uh, you know, General Motors or Toyota will build uh, uh, clay models. And they're very accurate, detailed models that, that um, can cost up to a quarter million dollars, up to half a million dollars to build because they're very detailed. Uh, if, if I had a clay model, one of their clay models uh, 10 yards away from me, I, I wouldn't be able to tell it wasn't a real car because it, it's painted with real paint. Uh, it's got all the same lines. It's got the same rims and tires on it. Uh, and, the, and the problem with that is they're very expensive and, and they're very time consuming to make. So. Uh, they like to do as much as they can in, in virtual space because it cuts down on the clay models and, and uh, gets them to market uh, a lot quicker. And then uh, education and research. Uh, one of the neat things about uh, Iowa State here with the Virtual Reality Application Center is just the wide variety of, of um, things that they work on. But we have customers that are also very focused on specific areas, um, and that can be, you know, um, anything from, from molecular biology to um, you know, virtual art and media um, to unmanned aerial vehicles. So um, we get into a lot of interesting applications, and um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, and it's always fun to, to get involved with some of these customers because you get to learn about a lot of stuff that 
you never really thought you'd ever learn about. So, um, and the same thing with, with uh, life sciences, medical imaging, um, biotech, and that sort of thing. So again, applying virtual reality and visualization to uh, solving problems. So in terms of where we've, you know, we're, we're a pretty small company, but yet we've done business all over the place. And, uh, you know, and really on every continent, but Antarctica, and we'd love to do a project there at some point. Uh, and what's interesting is we get, um, uh, you know, some weird triangles going. So today, just today, uh, we received a purchase order from uh, PSA Peugeot, which is a car company in France, and we've done some systems in, in uh, Paris for them. Uh, they gave us a purchase order today to build a system for them in Brazil. So, you know, here we are, this U.S.-based company with a French customer who wants us to build something for them in Brazil. So you can see it, gets, it can get uh, complicated in a hurry to, to make all this stuff work. Um, so talk a little bit about our, our first project. One of, one of our earliest projects, believe it or not, was, was in Taiwan. So, um, you know, and, and um, that's a long ways away from from Marshalltown, Iowa. What they wanted us to do was, was build a, um, it was basically a, a museum uh, attraction that, that what they wanted to do was to look at, um, have people be able to experience aquatic life as it existed a million years ago. So, you know, fish and everything that, that has long been extinct, um, they could actually go in this virtual space and, um, you know, swim with the fish, if you will. <clears throat> the interesting thing is they wanted uh, uh, to do this with a, a PC-based system. So 10 years ago, uh, when we were doing this stuff, we had to have these very expensive uh, silicon graphics computers uh, to do virtual reality, and these guys didn't want to do that. They wanted us to figure out how to do it with PCs. Uh, so that added another level of, not only was the, um, the fact that they were international uh, made it complicated, but the fact they wanted to do some pretty uh, dramatic technology um, uh, shifts with their system. So, you know, just some of the things y you wouldn't necessarily think about right off the cuff or just the fact that there are 14-hour time zone differences. Um, and to make it more challenging is they don't observe daylight savings time. So you got to figure out, okay, are they 13 hours ahead? Are they 14 hours ahead? Um, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning for them is, is, you know, what, 6 at night for us um, and that sort of thing. So you, you end up doing calls at night. Uh, you end up doing a lot of email. Uh, and then just the logistics of, of shipping, you know, um, several large um, containers full of stuff halfway around the world and getting people there and figuring out hotels and, you know, when you're not used to, to doing that kind of stuff, it, it, it ramps up the complexity pretty quickly. Um, and then talk a little bit later about uh, a currency because that also plays into this, uh, this stuff in a big way. We also did some early projects. Uh, some of our earliest projects um, were in Nigeria and Venezuela. We put on, uh, on the African continent what, what we think was the second um, uh, virtual reality system ever to exist there, and that was in uh, Nigeria, uh, just outside of Lagos, and that was for Chevron. So it was a U.S. oil company um, that wanted us to build a visualization uh, center for their um, facilities there. Um, so in that case, again, we're working through some U.S. companies, um, but you still had the challenges of getting people and material to, the, to where we were going. Um, you still need local help in terms of, you know, a lot of these places, you know, it, it's, not, uh, it's not so straightforward to say, you know, take this from point A to point B. You end up having to, to um, um, you know, pay people along the way. And it's not even really bribery. It's just how they do things. If, if you want this box moved over here, um, you have to, you know, somebody's got to do it, and that's just the way their economies are set up. Um, and, you know, in some ways it was easier having a Chevron or somebody like that kind of support us, but in other ways it was a lot harder because, um, you know, if we forgot something, you know, it's not, there was no Home Depot down the street or a Radio Shack down the street, and so we do a lot of these electronics sorts of things and construction sorts of things. So when you're shipping something around the world, you've got to make sure everything's in the box because if you show up on the other end and it's not there, it becomes a problem in a hurry. Um, one of the things that's, that's been interesting for us is just how our competition uh, has evolved. Um, at first, there were um, a number of uh, competitors around, um, but it was interesting. They were all based in other countries, so we kind of got started in the U.S. Um, there was a small company in the U.K., another small company in Canada, uh, one in Germany and one in Japan, um, but, but everything was global. We were competing against the, the UK company and the Canadian company for jobs in Houston. Uh, we were competing against them for, for jobs in uh, Munich uh, or London, uh, and it, it, um, it was interesting. But one of the things that's happened is a lot of these companies no longer exist. Uh, so we actually acquired the company in Canada. Uh, one of our competitors acquired um, 
a company in Germany, uh, and so on. And, and now it's kind of our little company against a, a, a couple, two or three uh, sort of big multinational types, um, which is, you know, the way you compete with a small company is a lot different than the way you compete with a big company, and the way you compete with a Belgian company is a lot different than the way you might compete with a Japanese company. So um, you just have to figure all that kind of stuff out and what makes sense. Um, but at the same time, if you want to grow, you got to, you know, uh, again, as an entrepreneur, we probably 20% of our business uh, comes from overseas, and so that's a big chunk of business that you got to pay attention to. Culture is, you know, there, again, there's a lot of folks that'll that'll talk to you this semester and have a lot uh, deeper knowledge than I do on some of this stuff. But one of the interesting things for us is, is you know, nationalism is alive and well everywhere you go. You know, whether that's um, um, cyclones versus Hawkeyes in Iowa versus, you know, we do business in, uh, uh, just did a project in Wales in the UK. And, you know, the Welsh don't like the British or the Irish or the Scottish, right? I mean, they do, but it's, you know, you got to be careful sometimes of, of, you know, drinking the right beer when you're in Wales uh, to not get in trouble. So, you know, all the sort of customs and, and things like that, language barriers, if you're, if you're, especially if you're doing business in, in Southeast Asia, um, you know, when you're doing technology, you get into some, you know, pretty funky descriptions of statements of work, and you got to be careful because they're thinking you're delivering one thing and you're really not, and then, um, you end up with disagreements after the fact that, that aren't always so fun. Um, you know, we really believe you need local representation to be successful, so if you really want to sell uh, much into other countries, um, you're probably going to have to have a person there. But of course that creates expense, and, and if you're a small business, you know, that can be difficult. And also, if you're going to start employing people in these countries, uh, you have to start worrying about, um, you know, even setting up corporations. So. You know, in the U.S., you can have S corporations, C corporations, limited liability partnerships, and those sorts of things. Uh, now, multiply that times 10 because you have to have those same sorts of entities in all these other countries, and you have to understand uh, how the legal and accounting structures are set up, and you have to pay a lot of money to accountants and lawyers and, and all those, which is never a fun thing to do. Um, so talk a little bit about currency. I mean, this is really rubber meat in the road kinds of stuff, and it's, it's been a pretty interesting ride for us over the last five or six years. Uh, so the first example is, is what I call a revenue example. And, and think, think if you had a product or a service that you were going to sell for $100,000, and just, you know, it could be $10, but, you know, just think of it in, in a nice round number. In April of 2002, uh, a British customer would have expected to pay 69,000 pounds, give or take change, uh, in their local currency for that, that amount of stuff. Uh, on the, the Euro continent, they would have paid 112,000, almost 113,000 euros for, for that same thing. Uh, in Canada, they would have paid 158,000 uh, Canadian dollars for that. Uh, and so now, scroll forward to, the, I think the last time I was um, uh, with this group was, was eight, March or April of 06. Um, now that same $100,000 that I'm trying to sell into the UK um, now only costs them 57,000 pounds. So it's like you're able to give this, this customer in this country a, a big discount, 18% discount, and you didn't have to do anything. Uh, and so that gets real interesting in a hurry, especially if your competitors happen to be based in those countries and, and they're in the local currency. <coughs> so same thing in, in Europe. Uh, that's even a, a bigger s switch because uh, before a dollar was worth more than a euro, and then in March of '06 it was worth about 83 uh, cents to a dollar, or one dollar is worth about 83 cents. Um, and same thing in Canada. When the interesting ones you look at, and again these are places we do business. Um, you know, Malaysia and China didn't change a whole lot because they were very uh, tightly coupled to the U.S. dollar, which meant that in those countries you're not able to. Um, leverage some of those advantages and, and it makes it hard to sell something into China because, you know, our stuff's still too expensive. And then, of course, you look at Venezuela, a place where we did a lot of business early on. Um, the currency there really devalued after um, uh, Hugo Chavez took over. And so now you've, you know, you got 146 percent change in, in price. And so you can imagine we don't do a lot of business in, in Venezuela these days because of that, because they just can't afford it. So now let's look at just the last 18 months or so. So now that UK pound uh, has gone from 57,000 to 50,000 pounds. So that means um, 
in 2002, I could sell something for 70,000 pounds, and now they have you know a 20,000 pound discount on this stuff. And again, we didn't have to do anything. Uh, uh, Canada's again pretty dramatic. Canada's probably the most dramatic uh, one that we've observed, and it it affects us lots of ways because we have people up there. So our costs have gone up, as we'll get to in a second. But the the revenue um, uh, picture is a little bit different. So now Canadian dollar is almost the same value as a as a U.S. dollar, whereas five years ago it was a buck sixty. Um, so and the other thing you'll notice is that the the Malaysian ringgit and the China Chinese uh, uh, RMB have also uh, uh, changed quite a bit because they've they've now um, let their currencies float a little bit. It's still not very much and and, and not enough. Um, but even in China, over the last you know couple of years, you've seen a, a, a double digit sort of change. And then Venezuela is interesting because uh, with Chavez in power, they've they basically um, you know it's it's essentially a socialist economy, and the government just says here's the exchange rate. So there's been no change, um, even though. Um, you know, now there's starting to be a lot of shortages um, of basic products. I mean, when you do that kind of stuff, it just it really harms the economy. And Venezuela is going to have to do something pretty soon. Um, now, in the black market, Venezuela, there's you know, is another story. That's where the real trading of, of dollars and bolivars happens. But um, but again, we can't sell anything in the Venezuela these days just because of what their currency is doing. So now you start looking at costs. So let's say I had um, you know have an operation set up in, in the UK, maybe I've got a salesperson there and you know, I'm renting some office space and doing that kind of thing. Um, that $100,000 that I had to spend in April of 2002 now cost me $121,000. Uh, if I happen to be based in Paris, which we've had operations in Paris, that same $100,000 uh, uh, now costs $135,000. So very dramatic you know, sort of uh, changes in currency over the last five years, and it makes a, it makes a difference, um, especially when you're a small company and trying to, to exist on some of this stuff. Um, and again, this isn't inflation or anything like that. This is just, um, uh, just purely the exchange rates. Uh, and of course, you look at Venezuela, um, you know, boy, it's pretty cheap to do business there now, uh, except that since they can't afford to buy anything, even the $40,000 might not be a good investment. So now let's look at the changes just you know, over the last 18 months, uh, even more dramatic. Um, you know, the, in the UK, it costs about 40% more to do business there, almost 60% in, in Europe or Canada. Um, and even in, in Malaysia, China, and Japan, it's still gone up by about 10%. So, um, you know, and this is, these are things that are really outside of anybody's control. Uh, these are, you know, this is macroeconomic uh, phenomenon at work here. And, um, uh, but it makes it, really hard if you're trying to budget your income and expenses in some of these countries. Um, you can do things with what are called hedge, hedging instruments, um, and a lot of the bigger companies will actually use those things, but, but that gets very complicated because at the end of your fiscal year, um, when, when the tax accountants and the, the um, audit guys come in, it, you, know, they, you end up paying through the nose because of, of how they have to, to uh, do the accounting on it. And it really doesn't even matter anyway. It's all sort of hocus pocus at the macroeconomic level that, that no one can control anyway. Um, doing business locally helps. So if, if, you, if you manufacture everything you're doing locally and you hire all your people locally and you're selling locally, um, that can really minimize your um, exposure to, to currency. Um, but it does get complicated because you actually have to, to start, you know, you're, you're essentially creating companies um, in these in these. Um, geographies that are incorporated entities with legal and accounting and all that kind of stuff that goes with them. So um, my personal uh, opinion, I like a, US, a weak U.S. dollar uh, because our competitors are, are Canadian or Japanese or, or European. And so, you know, we're, we're really able to compete well with those guys right now because they have to do, you know, ultimately they're trying to do business in their own local currency. Um, so... Uh, but you do have to watch the cost side because as the dollar devalues, um, you have to you know spend more money if you're going to have presence in some of these countries. So I'm sure that uh, lots of people will, um, again, uh, that are smarter than I am, are going to talk about China and India for you. But you can't hardly give a, a globalization talk without at least touching on these countries. Um, um, actually, been uh, spent a fair amount of time in, in both uh, over the last few years. Um, and have a, a little bit different perspective maybe than some. Um, in terms of China, um, you know, and everybody, you know, you read this stuff in the paper every day, but I was really taken aback. I was in the, you know, Xi'an province um, 
um, a couple years ago, you know, big four-lane Interstate 80 type freeways going down the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, hardly any traffic on them, but boy, they're really spending money on infrastructure, and it was, it was pretty remarkable to see that level of, you know, uh, ability to move goods and services around, and, and all that's very key for manufacturing. In India, um, you know, when I was there, I was, I was amazed at how little infrastructure that country has. You know, I mean, dirt roads half the place, and you're not getting a four-lane I-80 kind of a thing going through the country there at all. And what that means is, you know, India, you're, you see a lot more services, you know, when you call customer service and you talk to somebody in India kind of a thing. Um, but manufacturing is a, a lot tougher for them to, to, to um, compete with with the infrastructure. Um, you know, China has a higher standard of living, but India has the world's largest middle class by far. I mean, when you've got a billion people, you know, your middle class um, um, gets pretty big in a hurry. Um, and they're also the world's largest democracy, but that means, you know, some messiness in trying to get anything done uh, politically. India is also home to 40% of the world's poor. Um, I mean, India is poorer than Africa, which I hadn't really paid that close of attention to and hadn't realized until I visited there. Um, in China, you know, you've got Guangxi, which is basically um, relationship kinds of stuff. So, you know, to sell something to somebody there, you've got to get to know them, and, and it takes, you know, two, three, four years to build these sort of things to sell anything. And then there's lots of, there's actually a lot of hidden trade barriers in China. Uh, we just did our first major project there this last year uh, and kind of discovered a lot of things that have, have made it difficult for us. So, for example, um, uh, they have this certification. You can't sell a lot of electronics equipment in, into China unless it's been certified by their official, you know, certification group. And it's basically just a trade barrier. Um, so essentially, um, we had to buy equipment from a Chinese vendor that we could have bought in the U.S. for a third of the price. Um, but it wasn't CCC certified, so we couldn't get it in back into China. Uh, and so it, 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 um, it, it's, trade protectionism is, is definitely alive and well in China, which is frustrating because uh, the U.S. doesn't have near this many trade barriers for China. And so if you want to manufacture something in China and ship it to the U.S., you know, you know, in a pure capitalistic sense, forget about politics for, for a second, you know, that's great. I um, mean, you, you can get stuff cheap in China and ship it over here and, and um, um, you know, sell it over here. Uh, if you're trying to sell something in China, the only way you're really going to do that today is to have factories and, and big infrastructure in China. Um, China is not real open to, for U.S. companies to just sell directly into China. Um, it's, it's very difficult, and they, they put a lot of barriers up for that. And if, especially if you're a service-type company as we are, where you, you rely on a lot of human capital to do these things, um, we're, we're really reevaluating our, our China strategy right now because we don't think it works for us very well. So um, uh, it's been an interesting last 12 months, and just, that's just a little vignette on, on um, you know, kind of some low-level stuff going on in China and how it's pretty difficult for an entrepreneur to, to, um, uh, to make it work there unless you're going to have a factory there and, and, uh, or unless you're buying product from China. Then that's, that's easy. So just some final thoughts here and then just open up for questions. Um, um, I assume you guys are reading the world of SLAT again or, or, um, or maybe have read it already. Um, you know, going global, uh, you know, that, you know, in the, 20 years ago, before the internet um, and email, uh, that was you know kind of reserved for the General Electrics and the General Motors and you know the big boys of the world. But now you've seen companies like ours that you know we've got 20 percent of our business coming from overseas, uh, and a lot of that's just the internet and email. So you know um, I find myself trying to think about you know what's going to be the, what's the next big leap uh, with that. Um, you know this quote here. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I look at this in two ways. So, you know, the point here is with this quote is, um, you know, somebody in Eastern Europe can make a table reservation for me in a, at a restaurant in Brazil, right? Um, and, and I get that. Um, but I think a key thing here is, is, is still the, the serving the steak, okay? Um, in, in a business like ours, um, it's really about serving the steak. And so um, I think the you know, in the U.S. and the, even down to the level of our company is we have to, f to, to be competitive, we got to figure out what serving the steak is in our world and, and be really good at that and be able to provide good service um, to customers. You know, I mean, you see it, uh, you know, I just recently moved and had to change my phones around and, and ended up talking to um, some folks in India about trying to get my phone switched. And, you know, they were very nice and very... Um, 
um, you know, uh, friendly, uh, but they really couldn't answer my question because they had a list of things. You know, I wanted some guy at my house, and the guy from India was not going to hop on an airplane and go to my house to fix my phone. Uh, and to me, that's 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 kind of serving the steak. Uh, and so, uh, I think that that you know, to the extent that you know, people starting companies in this room or, or companies you're going to go to work for, um, how to make it so that you know, globalization is a, is a double-edged sword, right? It can, it can be a great thing and it can also kill you. Uh, and so I think the, the service side of this is something to think about. Um, you know, manufacturing technology, um, you know, we're going to have to, until the Chinese currency comes, comes up to a, a free market level, um, they're going to be able to beat us on, on making parts cheaper than we are. So what that means is we're going to have to figure out how to, you know, replace manufacturing workers in a lot of ways with machines. And, and politically, you know, that's not a, a fun thing to talk about, but, um, you know, we're not going to be able to compete at a, just a labor cost level for, for a while. So we have to figure out, you know, advanced manufacturing technology um, and other things that, that, again, put some of the stake in this. And so it's not just about taking my reservation coming into the restaurant. It's also about giving me good service and, and a good product. So um, that's all I've got. Um, uh, in terms of formal stuff, I'm, I'm uh, certainly happy to take questions and go as long as you want. Well, we have a question from one of our on-campus students. Um, he's curious to know where you see the future of your research and development going, whether it be um, more, continue to be more towards your market here in the United States or if you see it um, as increasing overseas. And is that research and development for our company specifically or just for the U.S. in general? Or any country. Yeah, we, we're pretty sure. That's what he's okay. asking. Um, yeah, we're, we're probably not going to be offloading our, or offshoring our R&D anytime soon. I mean, that's kind of the lifeblood of any company. Um, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of big companies um, that, that do that, and they, and they try to contain it to certain, um, uh, certain very well-defined, you know, almost um, production R&D, if you will. Um, but we, um, a lot of what we do is, is actually custom for every, for every um, uh, customer. And so we end up doing, you know, the C6 is a good example of something that's never been done before and, you know, now see the wonder of the world. But, you know, a lot of that technology didn't exist before we started working on that project. And it would have been very difficult to, um, to offshore that somewhere else uh, in, in our particular space. And that makes me nervous in general when I hear about companies that are doing that because, um, it's just, you know, it's just too easy for mistakes to happen and you get some real sensitive piece of information that you want to sort of keep control over and pretty soon, you know, half of China has it um, and who knows how they're going to use it to compete with you later and it's not like you have a lot of recourse with, um, you know, I mean, China is, is, is um, you know, in terms of legal system and structure is still kind of the Wild West and, and as, as you guys all know, that you know, intellectual property and those things are, are um, pretty difficult to, to protect there just and it's it's not a good or a bad thing it's just you know the the legal structure there isn't isn't geared for that so no we probably won't be doing that anytime anytime soon other questions how does uh, mechdyne handle continuous product support like warranty work and other things like that in such a triangular sales setup like the Peugeot example you gave earlier? Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. Great question. Uh, and that's, again, serving the steak. Uh, that's, it's very difficult for us to keep a, a French company. Well, I'll say this. I apologize to French uh, people in the audience. It's very difficult to keep French customers happy in general. Um, but the, the only way you're going to succeed at that is to have local representation on, you know, in country. Uh, so we actually have a service organization that's it's actually managed out of Canada, um, but we've got people in all these geographies to provide, um, you know, local service and support because uh, when something goes down, you, you know, customers want somebody there immediately. And our stuff is, is fairly complex. It's, you know, we can certainly uh, troubleshoot things over the phone, um, but more often than not, we end up having to dispatch a, a technician. Um, and, you know, first of all, our, our Marshalltown-based guys don't want to be told, you know, they're on the next plane to Malaysia in, in five minutes, um, you know, and then it takes 30 hours to get there. So, um, you know, service and maintenance and warranty is something that, that we work really hard to make sure we have local support um, wherever possible because uh, you just have to do it for good customer service. 
Uh, sounds like you're saying the uh, change in the economy of the other countries is kind of good for your business as far as making the dollar weaker and uh, giving you more chances for business. But is that kind of an indication that our economy is getting a little weaker and these other countries are getting uh, stronger? Um, you know, again, that's probably above my pay grade. But, um, you know, I mean, the U.S. economy is still, you know, the largest in the world. And it's, it's um, um, I don't think it's reflective of the economy per se. My opinion only is it's, it's more a reflection of the poor manner in which our country manages our finances. Um, so the problem we've got is, is uh, we're, we're, we're piling on debt uh, every year at a, at a rapid rate. And, you know, now to service that debt, we have to have all these foreign entities, you know, own a chunk of it. You know, I mean, I, I might be getting this wrong, so don't quote me, but I think China owns either the largest or one of the largest shares of, of U.S. national debt uh, in some fashion or another. And, you know, when you have to start adjusting interest rates and, and doing all that stuff, it makes a big difference in currency. So um, it's kind of a wishy-washy answer. I mean, I think our economy in terms of, you know, you look at productivity, we're still the most productive country on the planet by far. Um, if you look at our GNP and all those sorts of measures, you know, um, we're still, a, you know, a very strong economy. But we need to, again, my opinion is we need to figure out how to better manage our our finances, because that's what's driving a lot of the currency fluctuations, I think, or, or weakening the dollar quite a bit. Um, so, great question. You talked about um, legal problems like in China with copyright infringement and things like that. Are there any like international agencies or justice systems that you can go to to, to try and solve these legal issues? Yeah, I mean, our recent contract, one of the things I highly recommend that we, that we tried to do on, on our project there was, you know, you have a contract, first of all, that, that always helps. Uh, and then there's usually a, a section on these things that says, what's the governing law? And so we negotiate, of course, they wanted to be Chinese law. And what we negotiated successfully was to uh, base it in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, being a former British colony, has a pretty westernized legal structure uh, and and, you know, based on a lot, large part of, you know, British common law and that sort of thing, which, which helps. Um, but what could happen with China, especially we're doing business there with a very large automotive manufacturer, you know, they can drag this stuff out for years, right? I mean, you might eventually get them to Hong Kong to, to, to arbitrate, um, but it might take you, you know, a long time to get them there. And, and meanwhile, we're this little company, maybe we're not getting paid or, or, or they're, you know, infringing on some piece of intellectual property and, you know, you'd like to get an injunction to force them to stop, but by the time you actually get it to Hong Kong, five years later, the technology's old hat anyway, and, and you're kind of, you know, hosed at that point, to use a technical term. But, but if you can get, you know, we, we, we did a project in Egypt. We always try to get um, sort of a neutral, most, most of these customers won't let you do Iowa law, for example, as much as we'd like to. Um, so we, our project in Egypt was, you know, uh, based on, on um, uh, English law and based in London, and, and location's also important. You know, you can be based on, on British law, but, you know, maybe administered in Cairo. Nah, you want to you do that in London if you can. So. I know you guys do a lot of projects all over the world. Is there a country or a certain part of the world where... Um, I guess your company sees as uh, the biggest potential for profits or expansion in the near future? <laughs> Great question. Um, for us, right now, the, the big international market for us to look at is the Middle East. And most of that's driven by oil and gas. Uh, so that's a talk about a double edged sword um, because, you know, there, there's. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with all the expansion that's happening in Dubai, for example, and it's, it's some phenomenon, you know, like three-fourths of the world's cranes are in Dubai right now, you know, just throwing up buildings um, like candy. Um, so that part of the world has just, and it's all to do with the price of oil, right? You guys are reading the oil book, I think, um, uh, and, um, you know, it's just making the Middle East just, you know, just money dripping off trees over there. Um, but now you have the flip side of, okay, we've got to send people over there, and, and it's, it's not exactly the most friendly part of the world to, to U.S. citizens. 
Um, so we're trying, you know, we just did a project in, in Qatar, um, in Doha, and we tried to service that out of, um, with uh, Europeans, um, uh, which helps with the time zones and all that sort of thing. But um, the Middle East is booming economically, and it's, it's, it's a very um, um, ripe target for us to, to, to exploit. But, um, you know, nothing's easy. Uh, you have to worry about all the, the other issues in the Middle East right now as well, because, you know, let's face it, the U.S. isn't the most popular country in that part of the world. We have another question from one of our off-campus students. And um, he's curious if you experience any resistance from your local employment against going global. He actually works in Marshalltown um, with, a, with Fisher, and they happen to see some resistance against their expansion plans in other countries. Yeah, you know, um, and, and I suppose that could be due to, um, you know, Fisher's a large manufacturer and, and um, you know, a union shop, and I'm sure there's resistance from, from the union to put factories in China and those kinds of places. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, um, um, you know, a pretty thorny issue in, in the U.S. in general right now, as everybody's aware. In our case, um, because we're a, you know, we're more of a service company, so we, we build these systems. But we have to actually send people to these countries to go, to go build them. And most of our U.S. employees, you know, they like, like to travel, like to see parts of the world, but, you know, they, they also like to sleep in their own beds at night. So we don't get a lot of resistance from, from our folks about uh, doing business overseas, um, and they're pretty happy to have us hire, you know, people in those geographies to do most of the work there locally. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of our guys travel. I travel all the time. Um, but we haven't seen a lot of resistance uh, on that basis. And, um, you know, it also comes down, you know, in our company, we've got, you know, compensation structure on profit sharing and all that. So to the extent we can, we can do profitable business else, elsewhere in the world helps their bottom lines uh, individually. And, and if we can, you know, as, as long as they don't have to go to Siberia too often, in any given year, they're, they're pretty happy to, to do that. But um, if we hire somebody in Siberia to help put in some of those systems, they're okay with that too. Chris, I got a question uh, that I hear a lot from my student friends here. They graduate and they want to know um, about an MBA. Mm -hmm. How, do you, you can kind of, I mean, you did it all at the same time here, but what do you have to say about uh, MBAs on behalf of young folks that are on their way out of school? Good question. Uh, my opinions on MBAs, which are my own, um, so don't uh, uh, throw rocks at me if, if you disagree. Um, I got an MBA because I felt like I didn't understand or, or didn't have enough formal training on some pretty important things for running a company, uh, namely finance, accounting, strategic planning, uh, and those sorts of things. So uh, an MBA for me was of high value just to get some structure and understand what a balance sheet is, uh, being able to look at a profit and loss statement. And, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, you need to look at your numbers on a daily basis um, to know how you're doing and where you're at. And, um, you know, you're not... You're d definitely not living large in terms of, you know, big fat bank accounts and that kind of thing. So, um, and, and I found that to be very useful. Now, um, you also have to be careful because there's, there's what you learn in a textbook and then there's the real world. And as we all know, the, there can be differences. And so we've certainly gone, I've certainly taken my share of hard knocks just, just doing this stuff of things that, you know, you never learn in school. Um, you know, if, if your motivation to get an MBA is, 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 um, you know, I want to be a Harvard MBA so I can make, you know, twice the money. Um, you know, there's some merit for, to that maybe, but at least what I see in, in talking to a lot of big companies that we work with, um, you know, that's not enough in and of itself. Um, it's more about having some, you know, having some basic business knowledge is a good thing, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't invest in an MBA just because I think it's going to, you know, help me make a lot more money, or, or if that's my motivation for doing it, it's probably not going to work out too well for you, because most companies uh, anymore aren't, aren't looking at hiring MBAs just because they have MBAs, uh, if that makes sense. So I guess to, to put it a little more succinctly is have a reason to do it. You know, if, if you think you want to be in management someday or run a company or start a company, um, it probably makes a lot of sense. Um, 
you know, if, if it's to get a little bit better job, you know, there, there's, there may be some advantages to that, but um, I just have a good reason to do it, I guess, is, is what I would say there. But, uh, it, it, and it was very helpful for me. I mean, I'm glad I did it because I didn't know the first thing about a balance sheet before I took an accounting class. And I'm glad I know what a balance sheet is now because we'd have been out of business, you know, three days after I had started the company had we not known it. So. We have another question from our off-campus off -campus students. Um, how do you feel the U.S. is preparing engineers compared to other countries? And do you feel there is a shortage of quality engineers? Wow, good question. Um, I think the U.S., th there's no question. I don't know if, um, is it Newsweek, where Fareed Zakaria just wrote a, a, a big article. Um, and he was talking about Iraq and that stuff. But uh, one of the things he mentioned is, in there is that, you know, the U.S. still has the best universities by far. Um, I mean... Um, I, I think, you know, an engineering degree from Iowa State uh, is, you know, is, is going to be as good as it gets relative to, you know, the rest of the world, uh, even, you know, in the United States for that matter. Um, the problem that the U.S. has is we don't have nearly enough engineers. I mean, we've got a real cultural problem right now where a lot of, a lot of students are, are not going into science and engineering. Um, and you contrast that with India and China and, and Russia and Eastern Europe and a lot of other places, um, it's dramatically different. And that's going to bite us eventually if, if, we don't, if we don't figure that out. So <coughs> I think there's definitely a, sh uh, a shortage. I think the problem's only going to get worse. Um, but in terms of, so it's a quantity versus quality question, I guess. And, and I think the quality is outstanding. Quantity is what makes me nervous. is to uh, extend that question a little bit. How do you feel about uh, foreign people coming over here, getting uh, an engineering degree or an advanced degree, grad school or whatever, and then their student visa is running out and the U.S. kicking them back out of the country? Uh, personally, I think it's, a, it's about the dumbest thing that our country does right now um, because we've, we've got the best university system on the planet. Um, everybody wants to come here, so let's import you know, to the, because we don't have, you know, if we had more than enough engineers, I might have a different answer, but because we have this shortage, we got a lot of people from other countries that want to come here and be successful. I mean, that's the American tradition, right? Um, so we have to figure out how to open that up to, um, and, and fix that problem because um, I don't want those engineers going to China or India if we can have them come here and help, help the United States and our economy. Um, so, um, and again, this, all, all my opinions, so, um, but I, I think um, the, the immigration thing right now I know is a, is a very thorny topic, but um, I, I would hope we could all agree that, you know, any, if we can get other, the, the world's best and brightest and talented, most talented people to come here and live and work and, and, and be part of, um, you know, the United States, I mean, that's how our country is built, and we need to figure out how to, you know, maintain that, because uh, it, it, is, it is a big problem, for sure. Curious to see, how do you find sales leads in other countries? And have you found any particular countries easier to get sales leads? Well, we, we, have, um, uh, we have representative, you know, salespeople whose job it is to, to go after these geographies. Um, so, you know, we have a sales office in the UK, for example, and uh, Richard Cashmore's job is to go, you know, find customers there. Um, and then, of course, there's web and, and um, you know, advertising and trade shows and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, um, and then what helps us is in some of the smaller countries, if we've done a couple, three systems, you know, in the UK right now, uh, we pretty much own the UK from a, from a visualization virtual reality standpoint because we've done so much work there now. Um, and, you know, we get, now people just call us uh, to, do, to do work there. So, um, you know, but... It, since all politics are local, as I said, you know, you, if you want to do sales in these countries, you, gotta, you really should have a person that's either based in that country or, so for example, Richard handles, you know, the EU for us, and we, we've had some other sales guys on the continent as well, um, but it's real hard to do that from Iowa. Uh, 
Uh, do you think being from a small town in uh, from a not a metro city in Iowa is, has that been a an hindrance in in your business, or do you feel that it's been tougher that way, or would you be better off if you were in a in a metro city like New York, for example? So if I can understand the question, like you're saying, would we be better off in a big city versus in the middle of Iowa? Yeah, yeah. Um, great question, actually. Um, we get asked that a lot. Why in the heck are you in Marshalltown, Iowa? Um, and it's interesting. Most of the people that, or a lot of the people that ask that with kind of a, you know, puzzled look are actually people from Iowa um, who think the world revolves around Ames, Des Moines, Iowa City, you know, those sorts of places. Um, and I can tell you, when we get customers from all over the world that come visit us, and Des Moines, Iowa looks a lot like Marshalltown to them because it's, you know, it's all in the middle of the cornfields, right? Um, so we, we've had no, you know, sort of customer issues with them thinking, you know, geez, you're in this little place in Iowa. What, is, what does that mean? They actually, um, when we bring customers into Marshalltown, they, they think it's exotic, right? Because they're used to, you know, big cities or, or places that, you know, small town Iowa is not usually on their radar screen. So we, we take advantage of that as much as we can. From a business perspective, um, we, one of the reasons that we're still around and, and other companies that we've competed with are not is because they were based in California and, you know, London and some very expensive places. Um, and you, there's, for what we do with sort of high-end technology and services, you know, Iowa is a great place because the cost of doing business here is, is, is cheap. Um, so if I'm going to rent office space, you know, in Iowa, you know, maybe I'm paying 10, 20 bucks a square foot, Whereas if I'm doing that in, in you know, California, I might be paying 20 or 30 or 40 dollars a square foot and having to pay, um, you know, when you guys go get jobs, this kind of related but kind of not, you know, be careful. If, if somebody in San Francisco offers you a, a job that seems like it's, you know, pays you 30 percent more um, than the same job in, um, you know, let's say Des Moines or Marshalltown or somewhere in Iowa, you may actually be making less out there with that, even with that 30 percent um, uplift because, you know, to buy a 2,500 square foot house in Iowa might cost you, you know, 150,000 bucks or something, and might cost you a million dollars in the Bay Area. Um, so you really got to pay attention to that kind of stuff. But in our case, it's a, it's a lot like the currency issue because we're doing business on Marshalltown dollars, whereas these other companies are doing business on New York dollars or San Francisco dollars, and those dollars are a lot more expensive. Uh, and so we, we feel like we've got a lot of advantage to be in in a place that's that's easier to do business. Plus, I like my five-minute commute to work. Um, you know, I don't want to drive an hour one way in LA traffic to my job. I got, you know, I'd rather be spending that hour figuring out how to grow our business than playing uh, car hockey. Follow-up is, can you get the people you want? Yeah, g another good question. You know, we uh, getting people, good, getting good people is hard anywhere you go. We we have job openings right now. By the way, we have job openings. If anybody's looking for a job, um, but we, we have um, job openings in New Mexico, in Washington D.C., Virginia Beach, Marshalltown, Iowa, um, potentially Paris, uh, and it's been interesting. We we have tro You know, it, it's it's all about finding the right fit for your company and and finding the right people, but. We've had our, our opening in D.C. has been open a lot longer um, currently than some of our Marshalltown openings. So um, it's, you know, you do have to worry about that. Um, because of the nature of our business, you know, people get to travel and see cool stuff as, as part of their day job. Um, so it's kind of exciting, and they, they get some of that pizzazz that, that um, um, you know, to, to spice things up a little bit. And then they've, they've you know, they've got the option to, to go work out of some of our other offices as they move up the career ladder and, Maybe you decide you want to go do software in Virginia Beach because you've done all you can do in Marshalltown. You know, you can do that. So, um, but we've, you know, I feel like we've done a pretty reasonable job of getting good people. But I guess what I've learned is getting good people is hard, you know, no matter where you go. And it hasn't been dramatically harder in Marshalltown than it has been in some other places. It's, it just, it's time consuming and takes a lot of work. I think we'll... Uh We'll call a halt here. I'm sure Chris will uh, will stay after if you want to apply for that DC job. I understand it pays really a lot, and you don't have to work very hard. Um, Chris, thank you very much. It's thank great you.
thank you. Good to be here. Great. Uh, I didn't realize you did so much work for museums. I saw a British Museum up there. And... Spanish Museum. It's mm -hmm. it's um, we do it's it's a fairly small segment of our business, but it's kind of the funner stuff because it's you know yeah. doing something yeah. at British Museums kind of prestigious yeah. And, yeah. and interesting. So yeah. um, so we do, we do a reasonable amount of some of these places. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So it's it's fun. I sort of follow museums on my research. Oh, okay. So you do um, some of their exhibitions, uh, the, that type of thing? For well, for British Museum, they had a whole mummy exhibition on. Um, um, they would they would do MRI scans of mummies because you can't unwrap them. That's a big no-no. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I don't know if they're recording this. That's fine. Um, 